Welcome to TP Talks, PwC's Global Transfer Pricing Podcast Series. My name is Lauren Dangemer, and I'm here with my esteemed colleagues from across the world. Hamish McLuey from Australia, Ivan Williams and Tashara Carrera from Canada, Shimon Walswoski from the United Kingdom. We're here to do part two of our earlier episode, talking through oil field services and energy related topics. Specifically today, we'll talk a little bit about planning ESG, uh, environmental, social and governments, and a pragmatic approach to documentation. First off, let's start with planning, specifically looking at leasing and IP as we think about transactions. Hamish, why don't you kick us off from an Australian perspective? Thanks, Lauren. Um, so it's pretty topical, these two transactions uh, probably at the top of the list of focus areas for the ATO for all, for all field services groups. Um, maybe some comments on the leasing to start with. So for a number of years now, the ATO has been running a project looking at leasing of mobile assets, including drill rigs, other vessels, um, and, and other assets um, leased within the industry, both from a transfer pricing and a structuring point of view. The main areas of scrutiny tend to be leasing structures involving intermediaries with little substance or no commercial um, purpose or apparent commercial purpose, and transfer pricing models for leases which leave a cost plus return in Australia with the remaining profits, um, or in some cases losses, allocated uh, to the offshore asset owner or other entities. Um, on IP, uh, this is really for us in Australia the next, the next big thing for ATO review and audit activity. They're following their focus for a number of years now on cross-border financing. They've recently kicked off an internal project and released new guidance on transfer pricing for all things IP related, focusing on a number of different types of transfer pricing licensing arrangements where they see high risk. Um, not only from a transfer pricing, but also from a DBT and anti-avoidance perspective. Um, this IP project isn't specific to any one industry, but we we have seen all field services companies among those which the ATO is conducting their IP focused uh, TP audits on. Shimon, uh, no, you, leasing's been long been a, a sort of a big topic in the UK. What's what's happening in your patch uh, in recent times? Uh, thanks, Hamish. Indeed, it's interesting. In, in fact, it's the one of very few areas where the UK tax authority is on the record with a concrete view. Uh, that view was built uh, with respect to the uh, Berbo Charter and got published on the Oil Taxation Manual. Uh, it's interesting because it's quite wide and it describes not only which method it should be using, to come up with the arm's length verbal charter. Spoiler alert, it's a residual profit split, but also comments when other areas could potentially be used, which is unusual, and present some views about the profitability or the factors uh, using which the residual profit split should be applied. Um, accordingly, we've seen those being used also outside the bareboat space for normal charters and in the normal leasing. Uh, accordingly, I would say this is a very interesting area from the European transfer pricing perspective. Uh, over to you, Lauren. Thank you, Shimon. While many companies don't lease in the US, there is significant global aspect that comes into play with the treatment for IP, or excuse me, related to the leasing, specific for the treatment of the IP for the assets, or in some cases, potentially the lack thereof, and there's also a customs impact that comes into play specifically for a lot of Latin American companies. In recent talks with a number of companies, there is a question or at least a discussion of leasing versus buy sell models, depending on the operational structure. In other cases, companies have taken a hybrid approach. Very similar to what Hamish mentioned in Australia, there is a focus on a number of companies for the substance behind leasing. While it has traditionally been a substance light transaction, we have been working with companies to focus on telling the story for the business substance behind the leasing, right? Putting together the facts of what may be light in terms of people, 
can have a very heavy substance in terms of decision making risks assumed, such as utilization and other type functions. Regarding the IP, the IRS has taken a similar stance to many other countries that we discussed on our first episode. Specifically, there has been an increased focus in the treatment of IP and looking into the details of any change in treatment to the IP. With pending tax reform and the changing legislative landscape that we talked about in the first episode, this, these are both very top of mind for many companies in the US and when they look at their global footprint. Ivan, why don't we talk a little bit more about Canada? The comments made by Hamish in respect of leasing and scrutiny on structures with intermediaries with limited substance is applicable to Canada. The increasing global focus on substance has presented challenges given the difficult operating environment in the IFS sector over recent years and scarcity of resources to meet the increasing substance expectations. Similar comments can be made in respect of intellectual property, which has always been a target area for the CRA. Thanks. Another industry specific topic that is top of mind for many is ESG. While it may seem like a buzzword, it's got some very relevant points of consideration for transfer pricing specialists. Shimon, from the UK and European perspective, why don't you kick us off? Thank you, Lauren. Indeed, ESG seems to be the fastest growing area in transfer pricing, perhaps with the exception of Pillar 1 and Pillar 2. Uh, perhaps it's because it's so wide. I mean, it covers G, the governance, uh, which actually started with the BEPS and covers quite a lot of stuff like a public CBCR, which is very hot in the EU this year. Uh, all the way to E, environmental, uh, which started early on uh, and recently got quite a lot of steam uh, with the COP26 and, and related discussions about, uh, about the environment. In terms of transfer pricing, what we see is a lot of focus on the carbon. And it's not anymore just the compulsory carbon emission certificates that the oil and gas companies have to source and then surrender to the governments. It's much more wider with uh, companies all over the world trying to become net zero by getting the voluntary carbon. So carbon is a big part of transfer pricing in the ESG space. The second hot area is ironically uh, costs of uh, net zero and ESG more broadly. We see the international group spending a lot of money, sometimes in billions, on becoming ESG compliant on the top. Those costs typically go down and there is a big push back on the local opcos level against the deductibility of those costs. Uh, the last area that we see relates to the environmentally friendly energy. We see a lot of clients going net zero through purchases of renewable electricity, for example, through the corporate power purchasing agreement. That puts more flow through the related party sourcing strategies with the obvious TP consequences. So that's what we see in Europe. Uh, what about Australia? Yeah, I might just make, make a couple of brief comments, Shimon. I think here in Australia, perhaps we haven't got uh, as well-developed markets around some of these these direct um, uh, issues to do with transfer pricing for carbon trading and the like. I think that's at an earlier stage, but no doubt will come. But what we are seeing is is, is a big focus from the ATO at, at the, on the G <laughs> with an ESG, so tax risk governance, and, and it's become a a massive part of all the review and audit activities. Um, it's 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 at a stage now where it's no longer enough for responses to ATO inquiries to simply explain companies' technical positions. Um, the ATO also expects taxpayers to provide significant information and evidence around how they manage and govern tax risk. And there are actually explicit whole sections of their of their reviews and audits actually dealing with getting assurance around that. Um, to the point now where the ATO scoring frameworks and the risk rating frameworks um, won't allow taxpayers to actually get a low, overall low risk rating and, unless they're actually scoring well on their tax risk governance processes. Um, so I think that's the, uh, on my ESG spectrum, I think that's the, the really big one here in, in Australia at the moment for, for taxpayers to be aware of. Thanks, guys. I think from an America's perspective, 
we are still seeing um, looking at, at Europe and, and some other jurisdictions as to how things are progressing, but it's very top of mind for a lot of individuals um, in, in corporate groups, as well as trickling down through tax and transfer pricing. So we've been having a number of discussions with our clients, but I still feel it's a topic that there's a lot more to come as we progress. Thinking through, um, as we move closer toward the end of today's discussion, I do want us to think about all of the regulatory requirements and changes we talked about in the last episode, the social pressures, some of the controversy and planning that the industry is going through. We always come back to the same topic in transfer pricing, uh, documentation and compliance. We know the story of how we get to the policy and the methodology is very important. But let's talk a little bit about how we actually explain that in our documentation. I think it's very practical or very helpful for companies to hear how we balance that compliance requirement with a pragmatic or practical approach. So Hamish, I know you had some ideas from Australia, but I, I think this is one where we'll want to make sure we hear from everyone. Yeah, thanks, Lauren. Yeah, I might I might kick off with a few observations, and it's you know it's a challenging topic. How to, you know the word practical often isn't seen going hand in hand with with documentation, um, given the increasing compliance burden these days, um, and and we are seeing taxpayers uh, you know constantly wrestle with how they manage their compliance in a practical way, but still satisfy the authorities, uh, and and you know it's it's not easy. Um, one important learning I think is that companies that are doing this successfully are probably these days focusing a bit more of their attention compared to previously on explaining the business, explaining the value chain and the economic roles of the parties to the transactions rather than just, just the benchmarking the economic analysis. Um, my sense is from experience in recent years that companies that can demystify the business and how it works seem to be having greater success uh, and avoiding uh, initial scrutiny by tax authorities turning into a protracted dispute. So trying to really cut through and demystify the business rather than necessarily um, just focusing on, on building volume of documentation. Um, I think another theme is getting the right balance between a centralised approach to documentation, which a lot of groups take and, and should take um, from a consistency point of view, from a cost management point of view, but getting a balance between that and some level of local overlay or ground truthing of information um, is also um, very important. How about the UK, Shimon? What's the, what's the, uh, any, any tips on how to manage these things in your uh, part of the world? Thanks, Hamish. I actually have some great news. Uh, HMSC has announced as of 1st of December, that they are planning to introduce a local transfer pricing documentation requirement for all large taxpayers. That's after years of uh, not having specific requirements of this type. Uh, in parallel, HMSC promised taxpayers some FSAT, which will be a summary audit trail, which is supposed to replace the evidence log that they were hoping to get previously. Between now and April 2023, when the new transfer pricing documentation requirements kick in, HMRC will publish uh, detailed conduct and maybe some guidance as well. So very much watch this space. But I think an interesting development that we were not expecting uh, a couple of months ago. Thank you and over to you, Lauren. Thanks, Shimon. That is interesting. I know that impacts a lot of my clients as well. Um, from a U.S. perspective, the 66-62 regs are not new. Um, they deal with our compliance, uh, contemporaneous documentation, penalty protection. But the FAQ that was released in 2020 has caused an increased focus on the documentation in the IRS audits. We've even seen the IRS take a renewed interest in asserting penalties in some of our more recent audits and a renewed look at documentation, timing, content and execution of policy. From the US, we see a lot of companies looking at their global documentation requirements as they balance timing, um, global requirements. Often they take a focus of a clear, consistent approach. But as Hamish alluded to, while taking a global approaches and using templates is pragmatic, 
oftentimes, especially for this industry, it's important to layer on local specifics and also to tie back to the commercial rationale and industry impacts. I know specific with, with industry impacts from Canada, I, Ivan, I think you're gonna touch on it, but we're excited for Tashara to give us some pragmatic views given her recent time in industry as well. Yeah, thanks, Lauren. And I, I would agree and echo your comments and also Hamish's, um, you know, just the importance of having that locally focused uh, transfer pricing documentation. Um, you know, we've seen increasing expectations from the CRA in terms of the level of transfer pricing documentation um, that they expect to be prepared, as well as the supporting documents. And this is translated into a higher bar to meet the reasonable efforts test to obtain technology protection. Therefore, you know, that locally focused Canadian documentation is more important than ever and just cannot be some generic uh, global template that is rolled out where it really doesn't have any reference to Canada. But as you say, I'll pass it across to Thassara um, to give some specific uh, comments from, a, from a, her experience in industry. Thanks, Ivan. I wanted to add a few thoughts on what we can do to better prepare for the uptick in controversy that we're seeing and that we know that we'll continue to see. This uptick in controversy is coupled with the fact that tax authorities are now likely auditing the 2014 period and beyond, which is when most oil field services companies suffered low margins due to the downturn in the oil and gas industry. It's important for companies to have a robust global industry analysis to point to in order to justify these low margins or losses. So emphasize the unprecedented nature of the downturn, talk about the significant impact on the profitability of the players within the industry, the major reductions in headcount that we saw, significant M&A activity that we observed, and the number of bankruptcies. And as you progress through your documentation, refer back to this industry analysis often, particularly within the company analysis and the economic analysis. As Hamish noted, it helps to demystify the industry and the business as much as possible. And as we all know, we often deal with tax inspectors who may not have much knowledge of oil and gas or oil field services. And so providing this context is important. You often hear people say, no one reads the industry analysis or the industry analysis is not that important. For this industry, for this particular time period, a robust global industry analysis is absolutely critical. It's also helpful to construct pro forma financial statements in real time for high risk jurisdictions in order to demonstrate the impact that the downturn has had on your segmented or country financials. For example, the loss of customer contracts or the purchase of inventory or equipment in anticipation of revenues that didn't materialize. It's helpful to construct these in real time and keep them on file, as we often find that when we try to gather this information five years later, when we're under audit, personnel may have left or records are no longer available. And with that, I'll turn it back to you, Lauren. Thank you, Tashara. It was very helpful to hear that, um, especially from such a practical point of view. I think today and episode one together have been a really great series for us to talk through all that's happened on the legislative front, uh, controversy that we're seeing, how companies are thinking through planning and different strategy. But I want us to have a couple quick sound bites, right? At the end, what are key takeaways that, that each of you would share with the audience? Shimon, maybe we take a UK view first on this. Uh, thank you. When I prepared for this podcast, the key takeaway was ESG leasing and ensuring a consistent transfer pricing is in place. Uh, these were the three takeaways. But as of the 1st of December, uh, with the announcement of the UK local file requirement, I need to expand that list. I need to add that uh, preparing a local file and SAT will most likely be what is going to keep our clients and our staff busy for the next uh, year or so. From a, a U.S. perspective, it is a renewed focus in your U.S. documentation, just making sure that you do comply with, with the requirements of the regs, and also looking at documentation from and planning from a global perspective and keeping in mind the value drivers and everything that's happening as you put that, that documentation and that story together. A couple of comments from my point of view. I guess we've covered a bunch of different topics, quite diverse topics today, but I think one thread running through all of them is that things don't stand still in the world of transfer pricing. Uh, the, the focus areas of tax authorities shift, new issues like ESG arise, and simple things like the winning formula for managing compliance in a practical way change over time. So I, I think a, a key takeaway is it's important to try, be trying to look ahead um, and anticipate where things are going. 
um, rather than uh, simply looking backwards and, and rolling forward historic approaches to, to managing transfer pricing. Yeah, thanks, Amish. Yeah, I think that locally focused uh, transfer pricing documentation is, is key for Canada. And you know, while we've not seen a lot on the ESG front in Canada to date uh, from a transfer price inspector, I think expect this to gain momentum as it gains momentum in the wider economy. So I think watch this space in respect of ESG. Thank you so much, everyone, for your time today listening and, and for our panelists. I think it's been a great discussion and we heard a lot about ESG and some of the planning that's going on. But I think key takeaway really comes down to transfer pricing is a, is a global activity, right? As you're operating in, in multiple jurisdictions, it's important to take that overarching global view, but also to think about what's happening in each local country and jurisdiction that you operate in from an industry perspective and from a local ops perspective. Thanks again for listening. And thanks again to our panelists. Have a great day. This podcast is brought to you by PwC, all rights reserved. PwC refers to the U.S. member firm or one of its subsidiaries or affiliates and may sometimes refer to the PwC network. Each member firm is a separate legal entity. Please see www.pwc.com slash structure for further details. This podcast is for general information purposes only and should not be used as a substitute for consultation with professional advisors.